Chapter 30 You're certain everything's ready, Mura? Yes, Omi-san, yes, I think so. We've followed your orders exactly, Anigarashi sans Nothing had better go wrong or there'll be another headman by sunset. Igarashi, Yabu's chief lieutenant, told him with great sourness, his one-eyed bloodshot from lack of sleep. He had arrived yesterday from Yido with the first contingent of samurai and with specific instructions. Mura did not reply, just nodded deferentially and kept his eyes on the ground. They were standing on the foreshore, near the jetty, in front of the kneeling rows of silent, overawed, and equally exhausted villagers every man, woman, and child, except for the bedridden waiting for the galley to arrive. All wore their best clothes. Faces were scrubbed, the whole village swept and sparkling and made wholesome as though this were the day before New Year when, by ancient custom, all the empire was cleaned. Fishing boats were meticulously marshaled, nets tidy, ropes coiled. Even the beach along the bay had been raked. Nothing will go wrong, Igarashi-san, Omi said. He had had little sleep this last week, ever since Yabu's orders had come from Osaka via one of Toranaga's carrier pigeons. At once he had mobilized the village and every able-bodied man within twenty ri to prepare Anjiro for the arrival of the samurai and Yabu. And now that Igarashi had whispered the very private secret, for his ears only, that the great daimyo Toranaga was accompanying his uncle and had successfully escaped Ishido's trap, he was more than pleased he had expended so much money. There's no need for you to worry, Igarashi-san. This is my fief and my responsibility. I agree. Yes, it is. Igarashi waved Mura contemptuously away. And then he added quietly, You're responsible. But without offense, I tell you you've never seen our master when something goes wrong. If we've forgotten anything, or these dung-eaters haven't done what they're supposed to, our master will make your whole fief and those to the north and south into manure heaps before sunset tomorrow. He strode back to the head of his men. This morning the final companies of samurai had ridden in from Mishima, Jabu's capital city to the north. Now they, too, with all the others, were drawn up in packed military formation on the foreshore, in the square, and on the hillside, their banners waving with the slight breeze, upright spears glinting in the sun. Three thousand samurai, the elite of Yabu's army. Five hundred cavalry. Omi was not afraid. He had done everything it was possible to do and had personally checked everything that could be checked. If something went wrong, then that was just karma. But nothing is going to go wrong, he thought excitedly. Five hundred koku had been spent or was committed on the preparations more than his entire year's income before Yabu had increased his fief. He had been staggered by the amount but Midori, his wife, had said they should spend lavishly, that the cost was minuscule compared to the honor that Lord Yabu was doing him. And with Lord Toranaga here who knows what great opportunities you'll have, she had whispered. She's so right, Omi thought proudly. He rechecked the shore and the village square. Everything seemed perfect. Midori and his mother were waiting under the awning that had been prepared to receive Yabu and his guest, Toranaga. Omi noticed that his mother's tongue was wagging, and he wished that Midori could be spared its constant lash. He straightened a fold in his already impeccable kimono, and adjusted his swords and looked seaward. Listen, Murasan. Yuo, the fisherman, was whispering cautiously. He was one of the five village elders and they were kneeling with Mura in front of the rest. You know, I'm so frightened, if I pissed I'd piss dust. Then don't, old friend. Mura suppressed his smile. Yule was a broad-shouldered, rock-like man with vast hands and broken nose, and he wore a pained expression. I won't. But I think I'm going to fart. Yule was famous for his humor, and for his courage and for the quantity of his wind. Last year when they had had the wind-breaking contest with the village to the north he had been champion of champions, and had brought great honor to Anjiro. Yee, perhaps you'd better not. Haru, a short, wizened fisherman, chortled. One of the shitheads might get jealous. Mura hissed. 
You're ordered not to call samurai that while even ones near the village. Okay, oh, he was thinking wearily. I hope we've not forgotten anything. He glanced up at the mountainside, at the bamboo stockade surrounding the temporary fortress they had constructed with such speed and sweat. Three hundred men, digging and building and carrying. The other new house had been easier. It was on the knoll, just below Omi's house, and he could see it, smaller than Omi's but with a tiled roof, a makeshift garden, and a small bathhouse. I suppose Omi will move there and give Lord Jabu his, Mura thought. He looked back at the headland where the galley would appear any moment now. Soon Yabu would step ashore and then they were all in the hands of the gods, all Kami, God the Father, his blessed son, and the blessed Madonna, O Keo. Blessed Madonna, protect us. Would it be too much to ask to put thy great eye on this special village of Anjiro? Just for the next few days? We need special favor to protect us from our lord and master, oh yes. I will light fifty candles and my sons will definitely be brought up in the true faith, Mura promised. Today Mura was very glad to be a Christian. He could intercede with the one God and that was an added protection for his village. He had become a Christian in his youth because his own liege lord had been converted and had at once ordered all his followers to become Christians. And when, twenty years ago, this lord was killed fighting for Torunaga against the Taiko, Mura had remained Christian to honor his memory. A good soldier has but one master, he thought. One real master. Ninjin, a round-faced man with very buck teeth, was especially agitated by the presence of so many samurai. Mura san, so sorry, but it's dangerous what you've done terrible, nay. That little earthquake this morning... It was a sign from the gods, an omen. You've made a terrible mistake, Murasan. What is done is done, Nijin. Forget about it. How can I? It's in my cellar, and some of it's in your cellar. I've plenty myself, Yuo said, no longer smiling. Nothing's anywhere. Nothing, old friends, Mura said cautiously. Nothing exists. On his orders, thirty koku of rice had been stolen over the last few days from the samurai commissariat and was now secreted around the village, along with other stores and equipment and weapons. Not weapons, Yuo had protested. Rice, yes, but not weapons. War is coming. It's against the law to have weapons, Ninjin had wailed. Mura snorted. That's a new law, barely twelve years old. Before that we could have any weapons we wanted and we weren't tied to the village. We could go where we wanted, be what we wanted. We could be peasant soldier, fisherman, merchant, even samurai some could, you know it's the truth. Yes, but now it's different, Murasan different. The Taiko ordered it to be different. Soon it'll be as it's always been. We'll be soldiering again. Then let's wait, Ninjin had pleaded. Please. Now it's against the law. If the law changes, that's karma. The Taiko made the law, no weapons. None. On pain of instant death. Open your eyes, all of you. The Taiko is dead. And I tell you, soon Omi San need trained men and most of us have ward, nay? We've fished and ward, all in their season. Isn't that true? Yes, Murasan. Yo had agreed to his fear. Before the Taiko we weren't tied. They'll catch us, they have to catch us. Ninjin had wept. They'll have no mercy. They'll boil us like they boiled the barbarian. Shut up about the barbarian. Listen, friends, Mura had said. We'll never get such a chance again. It's sent by God. Or by the gods. We must take every knife, arrow, spear, sword, musket, shield, bow we can. The samurai think other samurai v stolen them haven't the shitheads come from all over Isa. And what samurai really trusts another? We must take back our right to war, nay. My father was killed in battle so was his and his. Ninjin, how many battles have you been in dozens, nay? Yo, what about you? Twenty? Thirty? More. Didn't I serve with the taiko, curse his memory? 
Ah, before he became Tycho, he was a man. That's the truth. Then something changed him, nay? Nin Jean, don't forget that Mirazin is headman. And we shouldn't forget his father was headman too. If the headman says weapons, then weapons it has to be. Now, kneeling in the sun, Mura was convinced that he had done correctly, that this new war would last forever and their world would be again as it had always been. The village would be here, and the boats, and some villagers. Because all men peasant, daimyo, samurai, even the ETL men had to eat and the fish were waiting in the sea. So the soldier villagers would take time out from war from time to time, as always, and they would launch their boats. Look, Yuo said and pointed involuntarily in the sudden hush. The galley was rounding the headland. Fujiko was kneeling abjectly in front of Toranaga in the main cabin that he had used during the voyage, and they were alone. I beg you, sire, she pleaded. Take this sentence off my head. It's not a sentence, it's an order. I will obey, of course. But I cannot do, cannot, Toranaga flared. How dare you argue? I tell you you're to be the pilot's consort, and you have the impertinence to argue? I apologize, sire, with all my heart, Fujiko said quickly, the words gushing. That was not meant as an argument. I only wanted to say that I cannot do this in the way that you wished. I beg you to understand. Forgive me, sire, but it's not possible to be happy or to pretend happiness. She bowed her head to the futon. I humbly beseech you to allow me to commit seppuku. I've said before I do not approve of senseless death. I have a use for you. Please, sire, I wish to die. I humbly beg you. I wish to join my husband and my son. Toranaga's voice slashed at her, drowning the sounds of the galley. I've already refused you that honor. You don't merit it yet. And it's only because of your grandfather, because Lord Hiromatsu is my oldest friend, that I've listened patiently to your ill-mannered mouthings so far. Enough of this nonsense, woman. Stop acting like a dung-headed peasant. I humbly beg permission to cut off my hair and become a nun. Buddha will, no. I've given you an order. Obey it. Obey, she said, not looking up, her face stark. Then, half to herself. I thought I was ordered to Yido. You were ordered to this vessel. You forget your position, you forget your heritage, you forget your duty. You forget your duty. I'm disgusted with you. Go and get ready. I want to die. Please let me join them, sire. Your husband was born samurai by mistake. He was malformed, so his offspring would be equally malformed. That fool almost ruined me. Join them? What nonsense! You're forbidden to commit seppuku. Now, get out. But she did not move. Perhaps I'd better send you to the ETA. To one of their houses. Perhaps that'd remind you of your manners and your duty. A shudder racked her, but she hissed back defiantly. At least they'd be Japanese. I am your liege lord. You will do as I order. Fujiko hesitated. Then she shrugged. Yes, lord. I apologize for my ill manners. She placed her hands flat on the futon and bowed her head low, her voice penitent. But in her heart she was not persuaded and he knew and she knew what she intended to do. Sire, I sincerely apologize for disturbing you, for destroying your wa, your harmony, and for my bad manners. You were right. I was wrong. She got up and went quietly to the door of the cabin. If I grant you what you wish, Toranaga said, will you, in return, do what I want with all your heart? Slowly she looked back. For how long, sire? I beg to ask for how long must I be consort to the barbarian? A year. She turned away and reached for the door handle. Toranaga said, Half a year. Fujiko's hand stopped. Trembling, she leaned her head against the door. Yes. Thank you, sire. Thank you. Toranaga got to his feet and went to the door. She opened it for him and bowed him through and closed it after him. Then the tears came silently. 
she was samurai. Toranaga came on deck feeling very pleased with himself. He had achieved what he wanted with the minimum of trouble. If the girl had been pressed too far she would have disobeyed and taken her own life without permission. But now she would try hard to please and it was. Important that she become the pilot's consort happily, at least outwardly so, and six months would be more than enough time. Women are much easier to deal with than men, he thought contentedly. So much easier, in certain things. Then he saw Yabu's samurai mast around the bay and his sense of well-being vanished. Welcome to Aizu, Lord Toranaga, Yabu said. I ordered a few men here to act as escort for you. Good. The galley was still two hundred yards from the dock, approaching neatly, and they could see Omi and Igarashi and the futons and the Ani. Everything's been done as we discussed in Osaka, Yabu was saying. But why not stay with me for a few days? I'd be honored and it would prove very useful. You could approve the choice of the two hundred and fifty men for the musket regiment and meet their commander. Nothing would please me more but I must get to Yido as quickly as possible, Jabu san. Two or three days? Please. A few days free from worry would be good for you, nay? Your health is important to me to all your allies. Some rest, good food, and hunting. Toranaga was desperately seeking a solution. To stay here with only fifty guards was unthinkable. He would be totally in Yabu's power and that would be worse than his situation at Osaka. At least Ishido was predictable and bound by certain rules. But Yabu? Yabu's as treacherous as a shark and you don't tempt sharks, he told himself. And never in their home waters. And never with your own life. He knew that the bargain he had made with Yabu at Osaka had as much substance as the weight of their urine when it had reached the ground, once Yabu believed he could get better concessions from Ishido and Yabu's presenting Toranaga's head on a wooden platter to Ishido would get Yabu immediately far more than Toranaga was prepared to offer. Kill him or go ashore? Those were the choices. You're too kind, he said. But I must get to Yido. I never thought Yabu would have time to gather so many men here. Has he broken our code? Please allow me to insist, Toranaga-sama. The hunting's very good nearby. I've falcons with my men. A little hunting after being confined at Osaka would be good, nay? Yes, it would be good to hunt today. I regret losing my falcons there. But they're not lost. Surely Hiromatsu will bring them with him to Yido. I ordered him to release them once we were safely away. By the time they'd have reached Yido they would have been out of training and tainted. It's one of my few rules only to fly the falcons that I've trained, and to allow them no other master. That way they make only my mistakes. It's a good rule. I'd like to hear the others. Perhaps over food tonight? I need this shark, Toranaga thought bitterly. To kill him now is premature. Two ropes sailed ashore to be caught and secured. The ropes tightened and screeched under the strain and the galley swung alongside deftly. Oars were shipped. The gangway slid into place and then Yabu stood at its head. At once the masked samurai shouted their battle cry in unison. Kasiji! Kasiji! And the roar that they made sent the gulls cawing and mewing into the sky. As one man, the samurai bowed. Yabu bowed back, then turned to Toranaga and beckoned him expansively. Let's go ashore. Toranaga looked out over the masked samurai over the villagers prostrate in the dust, and he asked himself, Is this where I died by the sword as the astrologer has foretold? Certainly the first part has come to pass. My name is now written on Osaka walls. He put that thought aside. At the head of the gangway he called out loudly and imperiously to his fifty samurai, who now wore brown uniform kimonos as he did. All of you stay here. You, captain, you will prepare for instant departure. Mariko-san, you will be staying in Anjiro for three days. Take the pilot and Fujiko-san ashore at once and wait for me in the square. Then he faced the shore and to Yabu's amazement increased the force of his voice. 
Now, Yabusan, I will inspect your regiments. At once he walked past him and stomped down the gangplank with all the easy, confident arrogance of the fighting general he was. No general had ever won more battles and no one was more cunning except the Tycho, and he was dead. No general had fought more battles, or was ever more patient, or had lost so few men. And he had never been defeated. A rustle of astonishment sped throughout the shore as he was recognized. This inspection was completely unexpected. His name was passed from mouth to mouth and the strength of the whispering, the awe that it generated, gratified him. He felt Yabu following but did not look back. Ah, Igarashi-san, he said with a geniality he did not feel. It's good to see you. Come along, we'll inspect your men together. Yes, lord. And you must be Kasiji Omi-san. Your father's an old comrade in arms of mine. You follow, too? Yes, lord, Omi replied, his size increasing with the honor being done to him. Thank you. Toranaga set a brisk pace. He had taken them with him to prevent them from talking privately with Yabu for the moment, knowing that his life depended on keeping the initiative. Didn't you fight with us at Odawara, Igarashi-san? He was asking, already knowing that this was where the samurai had lost his eye. Yes, sire. I had the honor. I was with Lord Yabu and we served on the Taiko right wing. Then you had the place of honor where fighting was the thickest. I have much to thank you and your master for. We smashed the enemy, Lord. We were only doing our duty. Even though Igarashi hated Toranaga, he was proud that the action was remembered and that he was being thanked. Now they had come to the front of the first regiment. Toranaga's voice carried loudly. Yes, you and the men of Aiza helped us greatly. Perhaps, if it weren't for you, I would not have gained the Quanto. Eh, Yabusama? He added, stopping suddenly, giving Yabu publicly the added title, and thus the added honor. Again Yabu was thrown off balance by the flattery. He felt it was no more than his due, but he had not expected it from Toranaga, and it had never been his intention to allow a formal inspection. Perhaps, but I doubt it. The Taiko ordered the Beppu clan obliterated. So it was obliterated. That had been ten years ago, when only the enormously powerful and ancient Beppu clan, led by Beppu Jensemin, opposed the combined forces of General Nakamura, the Taiko to be, and Toranaga the last major obstacle to Nakamura's complete domination of the empire. For centuries the Beppu had owned the eight provinces, the Kwanto. A hundred and fifty thousand men had ringed their castle city of Odawara which guarded the pass that led through the mountains into the incredibly rich rice plains beyond. The siege lasted eleven months. Nakamura's new consort, the patrician Lady Okiba, radiant and barely eighteen, had come to her lord's household outside the battlements, her infant son in her arms, Nakamura doting on his firstborn. Child. And with Lady Okiba had come her younger sister, Genjiko whom Nakamura proposed giving in marriage to Toranaga. Sire, Toranaga had said, I'd certainly be honored to lock our houses closer together, but instead of me marrying the Lady Genjiko as you suggest, let her marry my son and heir, Sidara. It had taken Toranaga many days to persuade Nakamura but he had agreed. Then when the decision was announced to the Lady Okiba, she had replied at once, With humility, sire, I oppose the marriage. Nakamura had laughed. So do I. Sidara's only ten and Genjiko thirteen. Even so, they're now betrothed and on his fifteenth birthday they'll marry. But sire, Lord Toranaga's already your brother-in-law, nay? Surely that's enough of a connection? You need closer ties with the Fujimoto and the Takashimi even at the imperial court. They're heads at court, and all in pawn. Nakamura had said in his rough, peasant voice. Listen, Ochan, Toranaga's got seventy thousand samurai. When we've smashed the Beppu Hill have the Kwanto and more men. My son will need leaders like Yoshi Toranaga, like I need them. Yes, and one day my son will need Yoshi Sadara. Better Sadara should be my son's uncle. 
your sister's betrothed to Sidara, but Sidara will live with us for a few years, nay? Of course, sire. Toranaga had agreed instantly, giving up his son and heir as a hostage. Good. But listen, first you and Sidara will swear eternal loyalty to my son. And so it had happened. Then during the tenth month of siege this first child of Nakamura had died, from fever or bad blood or malevolent kami. May all gods curse Odawara and Toranaga. Okiba had raved. It's Toranaga's fault that we're here he wants the Quanto. It's his fault our son's dead. He's your real enemy. He wants you to die and me to die. Put him to death or put him to work. Let him lead the attack. Let him pay with his life for the life of our son. I demand vengeance. So Toranaga had led the attack. He had taken Odawara Castle by mining the walls and by frontal attack. Then the grief-stricken Nakamura had stamped the city into dust. With its fall and the hunting down of all the Beppu, the empire was subdued and Nakamura became first Kwampaku and then Taiko. But many had died at Odawara. Too many, Toranaga thought, here on the Anjiro shore. He watched Yabu. It's a pity the Taiko is dead, nay? Yes. My brother-in-law was a great leader. And a great teacher, too. Like him, I never forget a friend. Or an enemy. Soon Lord Yaman will be of age. His spirit is the Taiko S spirit. Lord Tora. But before Yabu could stop the inspection, Toranaga had already gone on again, and there was little he could do but follow. Toranaga walked down the ranks, exuding geniality. Picking out a man here, another there, recognizing some, his eyes never still as he reached into his memory for faces and names. He had that very rare quality of special generals who inspect so that every man feels, at least for a moment, that the general has looked at him alone, perhaps even talked with him alone among his comrades. Toronaga was doing what he was born to do, what he had done a thousand times, controlling men with his will. By the time the last samurai was passed, Jabu, Igarashi, and Omi were exhausted. But Toranaga was not, and again, before Yabu could stop him, he had walked rapidly to a vantage point and stood high and alone. Samurai of Aizu, vassals of my friend and ally, Kasiji Yabusama, he called out in that vast sonorous voice. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to see part of the strength of Aizu part of the forces of my great ally. Listen, samurai, dark clouds are gathering over the empire and threaten the Taiko's peace. We must protect the Taiko's gifts to us against treachery in high places. Let every samurai be prepared. Let every weapon be sharp. Together we will defend his will, and we will prevail. May the gods of Japan both great and small pay attention. May they blast without pity all those who oppose the Taiko's orders. Then he raised both his arms and uttered their battle cry, Kasiji. And, incredibly, he bowed to the legions and held the bow. They all stared at him. Then, Toranaga came roaring back at him from the regiments again and again. And the samurai bowed in return. Even Yabu bowed, overcome by the strength of the moment. Before Yabu could straighten, Toranaga had set off down the hill once more at a fast pace. Go with him, Omi-san, Yabu ordered. It would have been unseemly for him to run after Toranaga himself. Yes, lord. When Omi had gone, Yabu said to Igarashi, What's the news from Yido? The Lady Yuriko, your wife, said first to tell you there's a tremendous amount of mobilization over the whole Quanto. Nothing much on the surface, but underneath everything's boiling. She believes Toranaga's preparing for war a sudden attack, perhaps against Osaka itself. What about Ishido? Nothing before we left. That was five days ago. Nor anything about Toranaga's escape. I only heard about that yesterday when your lady sent a carrier pigeon from Ido. Ah, uh, Zukimoto's already set up that courier service? Yes, sire. Good. Her message read, Toranaga has successfully escaped from Osaka with our master in a galley. Make preparations to welcome them at Anjiro. 
I thought it best to keep this secret except from Omi-san, but we're all prepared. How? I've ordered a war exercise, sire, throughout Aiza. Within three days every road and pass into Aiza will be blocked, if that's what you want. There's a mock pirate fleet to the north that could swamp any unescorted ship by day or by night, if that's what you want. And there's space here for you and a guest, however important, if that's what you want. Good. Anything else? Any other news? Igurashi was reluctant to pass along news the implications of which he did not understand. We're prepared for anything here. But this morning a cipher came from Osaka. Torunaga has resigned from the Council of Regents. Impossible. Why should he do that? I don't know. I can't think this one out. But it must be true, sire. We've never had wrong information from this source before. The Lady Suzuko? Yabu asked cautiously, naming Torunaga's youngest consort whose maid was a spy in his employ. Igarashi nodded. Yes. But I don't understand it at all. Now the regents will impeach him, won't they? They'll order his death. It'd be madness to resign, nay? Ishido must have forced him to do it. But how? There wasn't a breath of rumor. Torunaga would never resign on his own. You're right, that'd be the act of a madman. He's lost if he has. It must be false. Yabu walked down the hill in turmoil and watched Torunaga cross the square toward Mariko and the barbarian, with Fujiko nearby. Now Mariko was walking beside Torunaga, the others waiting in the square. Torunaga was talking quickly and urgently. And then Yabu saw him give her a small parchment scroll and he wondered what it contained and what was being said. What new trickery is Torunaga planning, he asked himself, wishing he had his wife Yuriko here to help him with her wise counsel. At the dock Torunaga stopped. He did not go on to the ship and into the protection of his men. He knew that it was on the shore that the final decision would be made. He could not escape. Nothing was yet resolved. He watched Yabu and Igarashi approaching. Yabu's untoward impassivity told him very much. So, Yabu-san? You will stay for a few days, Lord Toranaga? It would be better for me to leave at once. Yabu ordered everyone out of hearing. In a moment the two men were alone on the shore. I've had disquieting news from Osaka. You've resigned from the Council of Regents? Yes. I've resigned. Then you've killed yourself, destroyed your cause, all your vassals, all your allies, all your friends. You've buried Aizu and you've murdered me. The Council of Regents can certainly take away your fief and your life if they want. Yes. By all gods, living and dead and yet to be born, Yabu fought to dominate his temper. I apologize for my bad manners but you're your incredible attitude. Yes, I apologize. There was no real purpose to be gained in a show of emotion which all knew was unseemly and defacing. Yes, it is better for you to stay here then, Lord Toranaga. I think I would prefer to leave at once. Here or Yido, what's the difference? The regent's order will come immediately. I imagine you'd want to commit seppuku at once. With dignity. In peace. I would be honored to act as your second. Thank you. But no legal orders yet arrived so my head will stay where it is. What does a day or two matter? It's inevitable that the order will come. I will make all arrangements, yes, and they will be perfect. You may rely on me. Thank you. Yes, I can understand why you would want my head. My own head will be forfeit too. If I send yours to Ishido, or take it and ask his pardon, that might persuade him, but I doubt it, nay? If I were in your position I might ask for your head. Unfortunately my head will help you not at all. I'm inclined to agree. But it's worth trying. Yabu spat violently in the dust. I deserve to die for being so stupid as to put myself in that dunghead's power. Ishido will never hesitate to take your head. But first he'll take Aizu. Oh yes, size is lost with him in power. Don't bait me. I know that's going to happen. 
I'm not baiting you, my friend. Toronaga told him, enjoying Yabu's loss of face. I merely said, with Ishido and power your lost and Aiza's loss, because his kinsman Akawa Jiku covets. Aizu nay? But Yabu-san, Ishido doesn't have the power. Yet. And he told him, friend to friend, why he had resigned. The council's hamstrung. Yabu couldn't believe it. There isn't any council. There won't be until there are five members again. Torinaga smiled. Think about it, Yabu-san. Now I'm stronger than ever, nay? Ishido's neutralized so is Jikyu. Now you've got all the time you need to train your guns. Now you own Suruga and Tatami. Now you own Jiki's head. In a few months you'll see his head on a spike in the heads of all his kin, and you'll ride in state into your new domains. Abruptly he spun and shouted, Igarashi-san, and five hundred men heard the command. Igarashi came running but before the samurai had gone three paces, Torinaga called out, Bring an honor guard with you. Fifty men. At once. He did not dare to give Yabu a moment's respite to detect the enormous flaw in his argument, that if Ishido was hamstrung now and did not have power, then Torinaga's head on a wooden platter would be of enormous value to Ishido and thus to Yabu. Or even better, Torinaga bound like a common felon and delivered alive at the gates of Osaka Castle would bring Yabu immortality and the keys to the Kwanto. While the honor guard was forming in front of him, Torinaga said loudly, In honor of this occasion, Yabusama, perhaps you would accept this as a token of friendship. Then he took out his long sword, held it flat on both hands, and offered it. Yabu took the sword as though in a dream. It was priceless. It was a Minoira heirloom and famous throughout the land. Torinaga had possessed this sword for fifteen years. It had been presented to him by Nakamura in front of the assembled majesty of all the important daimyos in the empire, except Beppu Jensemin, as part payment for a secret agreement. This had happened shortly after the Battle of Nagakud, long before the Lady Okiba. Torunaga had just defeated General Nakamura, the Taiko to be, when Nakamura was still just an upstart without mandate or formal power or formal title and his reach for absolute power still in the balance. Instead of gathering an overwhelming host and burying Toranaga, which was his usual policy, Nakamura had decided to be conciliatory. He had offered Toranaga a treaty of friendship and a binding alliance, and to cement them, his half-sister as wife. That the woman was already married and middle-aged bothered neither Nakamura nor Toranaga at all. Toranaga agreed to the pact. At once the woman's husband, one of Nakamura's vassals thanking the gods that the invitation to divorce her had not been accompanied by an invitation to commit seppuku had gratefully sent her back to her half-brother. Immediately Toranaga married her with all the pomp and ceremony he could muster and the same day concluded a secret friendship pact with the immensely powerful Beppu clan, the open enemies of Nakamura, who, at this time, still sat disdainfully in the Kwanto on Torunaga's very unprotected back door. Then Torunaga had flown his falcons and waited for Nakamura's inevitable attack. But none had come. Instead, astoundingly, Nakamura had sent his revered and beloved mother into Torunaga's camp as a hostage ostensibly to visit her stepdaughter, Torunaga's new wife, but still hostage nonetheless, and had, in return, invited Torunaga to the vast meeting of all the daimyos that he had arranged at Osaka. Torunaga had thought hard and long. Then he had accepted the invitation, suggesting to his ally Beppu Jensemin that it would be unwise for them both to go. Next, he had set 60,000 samurai secretly into motion toward Osaka against Nakamura's expected treachery, and had left his eldest son, Noboru, in charge of his new wife and her mother. Noboru had at once piled tinder-dry brushwood to the eaves of their residence, and had told them bluntly he would fire it if anything happened to his father. Torunaga smiled, remembering. The night before he was due to enter Osaka, Nakamura, unconventional as ever, had paid him a secret visit, alone and unarmed. Well met, Torasan. 
Well met, Lord Nakamura. Listen, we've fought too many battles together, we know too many secrets, we shit too many times in the same pot to want to piss on our own feet or on each other's. I agree, Torinaga had said cautiously. Listen then, I'm within a sword's edge of winning the realm. To get total power I've got to have the respect of the ancient clans, the hereditary fief holders, the present heirs of the Fujimoto, the Takashima, and Minoera. Once I've got power, any daimyo or any three together can piss blood for all I care. You have my respect UV always had it. The little monkey-faced man had laughed richly. You won at Nagakud fairly. You're the best general I've ever known, the greatest daimyo in the realm. But now we're going to stop playing games, you and I. Listen, tomorrow I want you to bow to me before all the daimyos, as a vassal. I want you, Yoshi Toranaga no Minawara, a willing vassal. Publicly. Not to tongue my whole, but polite, humble, and respectful. If you're my vassal, the rest will fart in their haste to put their heads in the dust, and their tails in the air. And the few that don't well, let them beware. That will make you lord of all Japan. Nay, yes, the first in history. And you'll have given it to me. I admit I can't do it without you. But listen, if you do that for me you'll have first place after me. Every honor you want. Anything. There's enough for both of us. Is there? Yes. First I take Japan. Then Korea. Then China. I told Garota I wanted that, and that's what I'll have. Then you can have Japan a province of my China. But now, Lord Nakamura? Now I have to submit, nay? I'm in your power, nay? You're in overwhelming strength in front of me and the Beppu threaten my back. I'll deal with them soon enough, the peasant warlord had said. Those sneering carrion refused my invitation to come here tomorrow they sent my scroll back covered in bird shit. You want their lands? The whole quanto? I want nothing from them or from anyone. He had said. Liar. Nakamura had said genially. Listen, Torasan, I'm almost fifty. None of my women has ever birthed. I've juice in plenty, always have had, and in my life I must have pillowed a hundred, two hundred women, of all types, of all ages, in every way, but none has ever birthed a child, not even stillborn. I've everything but I've no sons and never will. That's my karma. You've four sons living and who knows how many daughters. You're forty-three so you can pillow your way to a dozen more sons as easy as horses shit, and that's your karma. Also your Minoera and that's karma. Say I adopt one of your sons and make him my heir? Now? Soon. Say in three years. It was never important to have an heir before but now things read different. Our late master Garoda had the stupidity to get himself murdered. Now the land's mine could be mine. Well, you'll make the agreements formal, publicly formal, in two years? Yes, in two years. You can trust me our interests are the same. Listen, in two years, in public, and we agree you and I, which son? This way we share everything, eh? Our joint. Dynasty settled into the future, so no problems there, and that's good for you and good for me. The pickings will be huge. First the quanto. Eh? Perhaps Beppu Jensamin will submit if I submit. I can't allow them to, Torasan. You covet their lands. I covet nothing. Nakamura's laugh had been merry. Yes. But you should. The quanto's worthy of you. It's safe behind mountain walls easy to defend. With the delta you'll control the richest rice lands in the empire. You'll have your back to the sea and an income of two million koku. But don't make Kamakura your capital. Or Odawara. Kamakura's always been capital of the Kwanto. Why shouldn't you covet Kamakura, Torasan? Hasn't it contained the holy shrine of your family's guardian kami for six hundred years? Isn't Hachiman, the Kami of War, the Minoera deity? Your ancestor was wise to choose the Kami of War to worship. I covet nothing, worship nothing. 
A shrine is just a shrine and the kami of war's never been known to stay in any shrine. I'm glad you covet nothing, Torasan, then nothing will disappoint you. You're like me in that. But Kamakura's no capital for you. There are seven passes into it, too many to defend. And it's not on the sea. No, I wouldn't advise Kamakura. Listen, you'd be better and safer to go farther over the mountains. You need a seaport. There's one I saw once Ido a fishing village now, but you'll make it into a great city. Easy to defend, perfect for trade. You favor trade. I favor trade. Good. So you must have a seaport. As to Odawara, we're going to stamp it out, as a lesson to all the others. That will be very difficult. Yes. But it'd be a good lesson for all the other daimyos, nay? To take that city by storm would be costly. Again the taunting laugh. It could be, to you, if you don't join me. I've got to go through your present lands to get at it. Did you know you're the Beppu front line? The Beppu pawn? Together you and them could keep me off for a year or two, even three. But I'll get there in the end. Oh, yes. Ye, why waste more time on them? They're all dead except your son-in-law if you want, ah. Uh, I know you've an alliance with them but it's not worth a bowl of horseshit. So what's your answer? The pickings are going to be vast. First the Quanto that's yours then I've all Japan. Then Korea easy. Then China hard but not impossible. I know a peasant can't become shogun, but our son will be shogun, and he could straddle the dragon throne of China too, or his son. Now that's the end of talk. What's your answer? Yoshi Toranaga no Minawara, vassal or not? Nothing else is of value to me. Let's piss on the bargain. Toranaga had said, having gained everything that he had wanted and planned for. And the next day, before the bewildered majesty of the truculent daimyos, he had humbly offered up his sword and his lands and his honor and his heritage to the upstart peasant warlord. He had begged to be allowed to serve Nakamura and his house forever. And he, Yoshi Toranaga no Minawara, had bowed his head abjectly into the dust. The Taiko to be now had been magnanimous, and had taken his lands and had at once gifted him the Quanto as a fief once it was conquered, ordering total war on the Beppo for their insults to the emperor. And he had also given Toranaga this sword that he had recently acquired from one of the imperial treasuries. The sword had been made by the master swordsmith Miyoshigo centuries before, and had once belonged to the most famous warrior in history, Minoera Yashitomo, the first of the Minoera shoguns. Torinaga remembered that day, and he recalled other days, a few years later when the Lady Okiba gave birth to a boy, and another when, incredibly, after the Taiko's first son had conveniently died, Yemen, the second son, was born. So was the whole plan ruined. Karma. He saw Yabu holding the sword of his ancestor with reverence. Is it as sharp as they say? Yabu asked. Yes. You do me great honor. I will treasure your gift. Yabu bowed conscious that, because of the gift, he would be the first in the land after Toranaga. Toranaga bowed back, and then, unarmed, he walked for the gangway. It took all his will to hide his fury and not to let his feet falter, and he prayed that Yabu's avariciousness would keep him mesmerized for just a few moments more. Cast off, he ordered, coming onto the deck, and then turned shoreward and waved cheerfully. Someone broke the silence and shouted his name, then others took up the shout. There was a general roar of approval at the honor done to their lord. Willing hands shoved the ship out to sea. The oarsmen pulled briskly. The galley made way. Captain, get to Yido quickly. Yes, sire. Toranaga looked aft, his eyes ranging the shore, expecting danger any instant. Yabu stood near the jetty, still bemused by the sword. Mariko and Fujiko were waiting beside the awning with the other women. The Anjin San was on the edge of the square where he had been told to wait rigid, towering, and unmistakably furious. Their eyes met. Torinaga smiled and waved. The wave was returned, but coldly, 
and this amused Toranaga very much. Blackthorn walked cheerlessly up to the jetty. When's he coming back, Mariko-san? I don't know, Anjin-san. How do we get to Yido? We stay here. At least, I stay for three days. Then I'm ordered there. By sea? By land? And me? You are to stay here. Why? You expressed an interest in learning our language. And there's work for you to do here. What work? I don't know, I'm sorry. Lord Yabu will tell you. My master left me here to interpret for three days. Blackthorn was filled with foreboding. His pistols were in his belt, but he had no knives and no more powder and no more shot. That was all in the cabin aboard the galley. Why didn't you tell me we were staying here? He asked. You just said to come ashore. I didn't know you were to remain here also, she replied. Lord Toronaga told me only a moment ago, in the square. Why didn't he tell me then? Tell me himself? I don't know. I was supposed to be going to Yido. That's where my crew is. That's where my ship is. What about them? He just said you were to stay here. For how long? He didn't tell me, Anjin-san. Perhaps Lord Jabu will know. Please be patient. Blackthorn could see Toranaga standing on the quarterdeck, watching shoreward. I think he knew all along I was to stay here, didn't he? She did not answer. How childish it is, she said to herself, to speak aloud what you think. And how extraordinarily clever Toranaga was to have escaped this trap. Fujiko and the two maids stood beside her, waiting patiently in the shade with Omi's mother and wife, whom she had met briefly, and she looked beyond them to the galley. It was picking up speed now, but it was still within easy arrow range. Any moment now she knew she must begin. Oh, Madonna, let me be strong, she prayed, all her attention centering on Yabu. Is it true? Is that true? Blackthorn was asking. What? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know, Anjin-san. I can only tell you Lord Toranaga is very wise. The wisest man. Whatever his reason, it was good. She studied the blue eyes and hard face, knowing that Blackthorn had no understanding of what had occurred here. Please be patient, Anjin-san. There's nothing to be afraid of. You're his favorite vassal and under his, I'm not afraid, Mariko-san. I'm just tired of being shoved around the board like a pawn. And I'm no one's vassal. Is retainer better? Or how would you describe a man who works for another or is retained by another for special? Then she saw the blood soar into Yabu's face. The guns, the guns are still on the galley, he cried out. Mariko knew the time had come. She hurried over to him as he turned to shout orders at Igarashi. Your pardon, Lord Yabu, she said overriding him. There's no need to worry about your guns. Lord Toranaga said to ask your pardon for his haste, but he has urgent things to do on your joint behalves at Yido. He said he would return the galley instantly, with the guns, and with extra powder, and also with the two hundred and fifty men you require from him. They'll be here in five or six days. What? Mariko explained patiently and politely again as Toranaga had told her to do. Then, once Yabu understood, she took out a roll of parchment from her sleeve. My master begs you to read this. It concerns the Anjin-san. She formally offered it to him. But Yabu did not take the scroll. His eyes went to the galley. It was well away now, going very fast. Out of range. But what does that matter, he thought contentedly, now over his anxiety. I'll get the guns back quickly and now I'm out of the Ishido trap and I've Toranaga's most famous sword and soon all the daimyos in the land will be aware of my new position in the armies of the east second to Toranaga alone. Yabu could still see Toranaga and he waved once and the wave was returned. Then Toranaga vanished off the quarterdeck. Yabu took the scroll and turned his mind to the present and to the Anjin-san. Blackthorn was watching thirty paces away, and he felt his hackles rise under Yabu's piercing gaze. 
He heard Mariko speaking in her lilting voice, but that did not reassure him. His hand tightened covertly on the pistol. Anjin san, Mariko called out. Would you please come over here? As Blackthorn approached them, Yabu glanced up from the parchment, nodded in friendly fashion. When Yabu had finished reading, he handed the paper back to Mariko and spoke briefly, partly to her, partly to him. Reverently, Mariko offered the paper to Blackthorn. He took it and examined the incomprehensible characters. Lord Yabu says you are welcome in this village. This paper is under Lord Toranaga's seal, Anjin san. You are to keep it. He's given you a rare honor. Lord Toranaga has made you a Hatamoto. This is the position of a special retainer of his personal staff. You have his absolute protection, Anjin san. Lord Yabu, of course, acknowledges this. I will explain later the privileges, but Lord Toranaga has given you also a salary of twenty koku a month. That is about. Yabu interrupted her, expansively waving his hand at Blackthorn, then at the village, and spoke at length. Mariko translated. Lord Yabu repeats that you are welcome here. He hopes you will be content, that everything will be done to make your stay comfortable. A house will be provided for you. And teachers. You will please learn Japanese as quickly as possible, he says. Tonight he will ask you some questions and tell you about some special work. Please ask him, what work? May I advise just a little more patience, Anjin-san. Now is not the time, truly. All right. Wakarimasuka, Anjin-san? Yabu said. Do you understand? Hi, Yabu-san. Domo. Yabu gave orders to Igarashi to dismiss the regiment, then strode over to the villagers, who were still prostrate in the sand. He stood in front of them in the warm, fine spring afternoon, Toranaga's sword still in his hand. His words whipped over them. Yabu pointed the sword at Blackthorn and harangued them a few moments more and ended abruptly. A tremor went through the villagers. Mura bowed and said hi, several times and turned and asked the villagers a question and all eyes went to Blackthorn. Wakarimasuka? Mura called out and they all answered. Hi. Their voices mixing with the sighing of the waves upon the beach. What's going on? Blackthorn asked Mariko, but Mura shouted. Kere! And the villagers bowed low again, once to Yabu and once to Blackthorn. Yabu strode off without looking back. What's going on, Mariko-san? He Lord Yabu told them you are his honored guest here. That you are also Lord Toranaga's very honored vast retainer. That you are here mostly to learn our tongue. That he has given the village the honor and responsibility of teaching you. The village is responsible, Anjin-san. Everyone here is to help you. He told them that if you have not learned satisfactorily within six months, the village will be burnt. But before that, every man, woman, and child will be crucified. Chapter 31 The day was dying now, the shadows long, the sea red, and a kind wind blowing. Blackthorn was coming up the path from the village toward the house that Mariko had earlier pointed out and told him was to be his. She had expected to escort him there, but he had thanked her and refused and had walked past the kneeling villagers toward the promontory to be alone and to think. He had found the effort of thinking too great. Nothing seemed to fit. He had doused salt water over his head to try to clear it, but that had not helped. At length he had given up and had walked back aimlessly along the shore, past the jetty, across the square and through the village up to this house where he was to live now and where, he remembered, there had not been a dwelling before. High up, dominating the opposite hillside, was another sprawling dwelling, part thatch, part tile, within a tall stockade, many guards at the fortified gateway. Samurai were strutting through the village or standing talking in groups. Most had already marched off behind their officers in disciplined groups up the paths and over the hill to their bivouac encampment. Those samurai that Blackthorn met, he absently greeted and they greeted him in return. He saw no villagers. Blackthorn stopped outside the gate that was set into the fence. 
There were more of the peculiar characters painted over the lintel, and the door itself was cut out in ingenious patterns designed to hide and at the same time to reveal the garden behind. Before he could open the door it swung inward and a frightened old man bowed him through. Kanbanwa, Anjid-san. His voice quavered piteously good evening. Kanbanwa, he replied. Listen, old man, o oh, nami ka? Nami watashi wa, Anjid-sama? Ah, watashi yukiya. Yukiya. The old man was almost slavering with relief. Blackthorn said the name several times to help remember it, and added, San, and the old man shook his head violently. I go min nasai. I san, Anjid-sama. Yukiya. Yukiya. All right, Yukiya. But Blackthorn thought, why not, San, like everyone else? Blackthorn waved his hand in dismissal. The old man hobbled away quickly. I'll have to be more careful. I have to help them, he said aloud. A maid came apprehensively onto the veranda through an open shoji and bowed low. Kanbanwa, Anjid San. Kanbanwa, he replied, vaguely recognizing her from the ship. He waved her away too. A rustle of silk. Fujiko came from within the house. Mariko was with her. Was your walk pleasant, Anjid San? Yes, pleasant, Mariko San. He hardly noticed her or Fujiko or the house or garden. Would you like cha? Or perhaps sake? Or a bath, perhaps? The water is hot. Mariko laughed nervously, perturbed by the look in his eyes. The bathhouse is not completely finished, but we hope it will prove adequate. Sake, please. Yes, some sake first, Mariko-san. Mariko spoke to Fujiko, who disappeared inside the house once more. A maid silently brought three cushions and went away. Mariko gracefully sat on one. Sit down, Anjin-san, you must be tired. Thank you. He sat on the steps of the veranda and did not take off his thongs. Fujiko brought two flasks of sake and a teacup, as Mariko had told her, not the tiny porcelain cup that should have been used. Better to give him a lot of sake quickly, Mariko had said. It would be better to make him quite drunk but Lord Yabu needs him tonight. A bath and sake will perhaps ease him. Blackthorn drank the proffered cup of warmed wine without tasting it. And then a second and a third. They had watched him coming up the hill through the slit of barely open shojis. What's the matter with him? Fujiko had asked, alarmed. He's distressed by what Lord Yabu said the promise to the village. Why should that bother him? He's not threatened. It's not his life that was threatened. Barbarians are very different from us, Fujiko-san. For instance, the Anjin-san believes villagers are people like any other people, like samurai, some perhaps even better than samurai. Fujiko had laughed nervously. That's nonsense, nay? How can peasants equal samurai? Mariko had not answered. She had just continued watching the Anjin-san. Poor man, she said. Poor village! Fujiko's short upper lip curled disdainfully. A stupid waste of peasants and fishermen! Kisiji Yabusan's a fool. How can a barbarian learn our tongue in half a year? How long did the barbarian Sakusan take? More than twenty years, nay? And isn't he the only barbarian who's ever been able to talk even passable Japanese? No, not the only one, though he's the best I've ever heard. Yes, it's difficult for them. But the Anjin-san's an intelligent man and Lord Toranaga said that in half a year isolated from barbarians, eating our food, living as we do, drinking cha, bathing every day, the Anjin-san will soon be like one of us. Fujiko's face had been set. Look at him, Mariko-san. So ugly. So monstrous and alien. Curious to think that as much as I detest barbarians, once he steps through the gate I'm committed and he becomes my lord and master. He's brave, very brave, Fujiko and he saved Lord Toranaga's life and is very valuable to him. Yes, I know, and that should make me dislike him less, but so sorry it doesn't. Even so, 
I'll try with all my strength to change him into one of us. I pray Lord Buddha will help me. Mariko had wanted to ask her niece, why the sudden change? Why are you now prepared to serve the Anjisan and obey Lord Toranaga so absolutely? When only this morning you refused to obey, you swore to kill yourself without permission or to kill the barbarian the moment he slept. What did Lord Toranaga say to change you, Fujiko? But Mariko had known better than to ask. Toranaga had not taken her into this confidence. Fujiko would not tell her. The girl had been too well trained by her mother, Bantaro's sister, who had been trained by her father, Hiromatsu. I wonder if Lord Hiromatsu will escape from Osaka Castle, she asked herself, very fond of the old general, her father-in-law. And what about Kirisan and the Lady Suzuko? Where is Buntaro, my husband? Where was he captured? Or did he have time to die? Mariko watched Fujiko pour the last of the sake. This cup too was consumed like the others, without expression. Dozo. Sake, Blackthorn said. More sake was brought. And finished. Dozo sake. Mariko-san. Fujiko said. The master shouldn't have any more, nay? He'll get drunk. Please ask him if he'd like his bath now. I will send for Suo. Mariko asked him. Sorry, he says he'll bathe later. Patiently Fujiko ordered more sake and Mariko added quietly to the maid. Bring some charcoal fish. The new flask was emptied with the same silent determination. The food did not tempt him, but he took a piece at Mariko's gracious persuasion. He did not eat it. More wine was brought, and two more flasks were consumed. Please give the Anjin-san my apologies, Fujiko said. So sorry, but there isn't any more sake in his house. Tell him I apologize for this lack. I've sent the maid to fetch some more from the village. Good. He's had more than enough though it doesn't seem to have touched him at all. Why not leave us now, Fujiko? Now would be a good time to make the formal offer on your behalf. Fujiko bowed to Blackthorn and went away, glad that custom decreed that important matters were always to be handled by a third party in private. Thus dignity could always be maintained on both sides. Mariko explained to Blackthorn about the wine. How long will it take to get more? Not long. Perhaps you'd like to bathe now. I'll see that sake has sent the instant it arrives. Did Toranaga say anything about my plan before he left? About the navy? No. I'm sorry he said nothing about that. Mariko had been watching for the telltale signs of drunkenness. But to her surprise none had appeared, not even a slight flush or a slurring of words. With this amount of wine consumed so fast, any Japanese would be drunk. The wine is not to your taste, Anjin-san. Not really. It's too weak. It gives me nothing. You seek oblivion? No a solution. Anything that can be done to help will be done. I must have books and paper and pens. Tomorrow I will begin to collect them for you. No, tonight, Mariko-san. I must start now. Lord Toronaga said he will send you a book what did you call it? The grammar books and word books of the Holy Fathers. How long will that take? I don't know. But I'm here for three days. Perhaps this may be a help to you. And Fujikosen is here to help also. She smiled, happy for him. I'm honored to tell you she is given to you as consort and she, what? Lord Toronaga asked her if she would be your consort and she said she would be honored and agreed. She will, but I haven't agreed. Please? I'm sorry, I don't understand. I don't want her. Either as consort or around me. I find her ugly. Mariko gaped at him. But what's that got to do with consort? Tell her to leave. But Anjin-san, you can't refuse. That would be a terrible insult to Lord Toranaga, to her, to everyone. What harm has she done you? None at all. Yusagi Fujiko's consen, you listen to me. Blackthorn's words ricocheted around the veranda and the house. Tell her to leave, Mariko said at once. 
So sorry, Anjin-san. Yes, you're right to be angry. But I'm not angry, Blackthorn said icily. Can't you? Can't you people get it through your heads I'm tired of being a puppet? I don't want that woman around. I want my ship back and my crew back and that's the end of it. I'm not staying here six months and I detest your customs. It's God curse terrible that one man can threaten to bury a whole village just to teach me Japanese. And as to consorts that's worse than slavery and it's a goddamned insult to arrange that without asking me in advance. What's the matter now? Mariko was asking herself helplessly. What has ugliness to do with consort? And anyway Fujiko's not ugly. How can he be so incomprehensible? Then she remembered Toranaga's admonition. Mariko-san, you're personally responsible. Firstly that Yabu-san doesn't interfere with my departure after I've given him my sword. And secondly, you're totally responsible for settling the Anjin-san docilely in Anjiro. I'll do my best, sire. But I'm afraid the Anjin-san baffles me. Treat him like a hawk. That's the key to him. I tame a hawk in two days. You've three. She looked away from Blackthorn and put her wits to work. He does seem like a hawk when he's in a rage, she thought. He has the same screeching, senseless ferocity. And when not enraged, the same haughty, unblinking stare, the same total self-centeredness, with exploding viciousness never far away. I agree. You're completely right. You've been imposed upon terribly, and you're quite right to be angry, she said soothingly. Yes, and certainly Lord Toranaga should have asked even though he doesn't understand your customs. But it never occurred to him that you would object. He only tried to honor you as he would a most favored samurai. He made you a Hatamoto, that's almost like a kinsman, Anjin-san. There are only about a thousand Hatamoto in all the Quanto. And as to the Lady Fujiko, he was only trying to help you. The Lady Usagi Fujiko would be considered. Among us, Anjin-san, this would be considered a great honor. Why? Because her lineage is ancient, and she's very accomplished. Her father and grandfather are daimyos. Of course she's samurai, and of course. Mariko added delicately. You would honor her by accepting her. And she does need a home and a new life. Why? She is recently widowed. She's only nineteen, Anjin-san, poor girl but she lost a husband and a son and is filled with remorse. To be formal consort to you would give her a new life. What happened to her husband and son? Mariko hesitated, distressed at Blackthorn's impolite directness. But she knew enough about him by now to understand that this was his custom and not meant as lack of manners. They were put to death, Anjin-san. While you're here you will need someone to look after your house. The Lady Fujiko will be, why were they put to death? Her husband almost caused the death of Lord Toranaga. Please, Khan. Toranaga ordered their deaths? Yes. But he was correct. Ask her she will agree, Anjin-san. How old was the child? A few months, Anjin-san. Toranaga had an infant put to death for something the father did? Yes. It's our custom. Please be patient with us. In some things we are not free. Our customs are different from yours. You see, by law, we belong to our liege lord. By law a father possesses the lives of his children and wife and consorts and servants. By law his life is possessed by his liege lord. This is our custom. So a father can kill anyone in his house? Yes. Then you're a nation of murderers. No. But your custom condones murder. I thought you were Christian. I am Anjin-san. What about the commandments? I cannot explain, truly. But I am Christian and samurai and Japanese, and these are not hostile to one another. To me, they're not. Please be patient with me and with us. Please. You'd put your own children to death if Toranaga ordered it? Yes. I only have one son, but yes, I believe I would. Certainly it would be my duty to do so. That's the law if my husband agreed. I hope God can forgive you. All of you. 
God understands Anjin San. Oh, he will understand. Perhaps he will open your mind so you can understand. I'm sorry, I cannot explain very well, nay? I apologize for my lack. She watched him in the silence, unsettled by him. I don't understand you either, Anjin San. You baffle me. Your customs baffle me. Perhaps if we're both patient we can both learn. The Lady Fujiko, for instance. As consort she will look after your house and your servants. And your needs any of your needs. You must have someone to do that. She will see to the running of your house, everything. You do not need to pillow her, if that concerns you if you do not find her pleasing. You do not even need to be polite to her, though she merits politeness. She will serve you, as you wish, in any way you wish. I can treat her any way I want? Yes. I can pillow her or not pillow her? Of course. She will find someone that pleases you, to satisfy your body needs, if you wish, or she will not interfere. I can treat her like a servant? A slave? Yes. But she merits better. Can I throw her out? Order her out? If she offends you, yes. What would happen to her? Normally she would go back to her parents' house in disgrace, who may or may not accept her back. Someone like Lady Fujiko would prefer to kill herself before enduring that shame. But she you should know true samurai are not permitted to kill themselves without their lord's permission. Some do, of course, but they've failed in their duty and aren't worthy to be considered samurai. I would not kill myself, whatever the shame, not without Lord Torinaga's. Permission or my husband's permission? Lord Torinaga has forbidden her to end her life. If you send her away, she'll become an outcast. Why? Why won't her family accept her back? Mariko sighed. So sorry, Anjin-san, but if you send her away, her disgrace will be such that no one will accept her. Because she's contaminated? From being near a barbarian? Oh no, Anjin-san, only because she had failed in her duty to you, Mariko said at once. She is your consort now, Lord Toranaga ordered it, and she agreed. You're master of a house now. Am I? Oh, yes, believe me, Anjin-san, you have privileges. And as a Hatamoto you're blessed. And well off. Lord Toranaga's given you a salary of twenty koku a month. For that amount of money a samurai would normally have to provide his lord with himself and two other samurai, armed, fed, and mounted for the whole year, and of course pay for their families as well. But you don't have to do that. I beg you, consider Fujiko as a person, Anjin-san. I beg you to be filled with Christian charity. She's a good woman. Forgive her her ugliness. She'll be a worthy consort. She hasn't a home? Yes. This is her home. Mariko took hold of herself. I beg you to accept her formally. She can help you greatly, teach you if you wish to learn. If you prefer, think of her as nothing as this wooden post or the shoji screen, or as a rock in your garden anything you wish, but allow her to stay. If you won't have her as consort, be merciful. Accept her and then, as head of the house, according to our law, kill her. That's the only answer you have, isn't it? Kill. No, Anjin-san. But life and death are the same thing. Who knows, perhaps you'll do Fujiko a greater service by taking her life. It's your right now before all the law. You're right. If you prefer to make her outcast, that too is your right. So I'm trapped again, Blackthorn said. Either way she's killed. If I don't learn your language then a whole village is butchered. If I don't do whatever you want, some innocent is always killed. There's no way out. There's a very easy solution, Anjin-san. Die. You do not have to endure the unendurable. Suicide's crazy and a mortal sin. I thought you were Christian. I've said I am. But for you, Anjin-san, for you there are many ways of dying honorably without suicide. You sneered at my husband for not wanting to die fighting, nay? That's not our custom, but apparently it's yours. So why don't you do that? You have a pistol. 
kill Lord Yabu? You believe he's a monster, nay? Even attempt to kill him and today you'll be in heaven or hell. He looked at her, hating her serene features, seeing her loveliness through his hate. It's weak to die like that for no reason. Stupid's a better word. You say you're Christian. So you believe in the Jesus child in God and in heaven. Death shouldn't frighten you. As to no reason, it is up to you to judge the value or non-value. You may have reason enough to die. I'm in your power. You know it. So do I. Mariko leaned over and touched him compassionately. Anjin-san, forget the village. A thousand million things can happen before those six months occur. A tidal wave or earthquake, or you get your ship and sail away, or Yabu dies, or we all die, or who knows. Leave the problems of God to God and karma to karma. Today you're here and nothing you can do will change that. Today you're alive and here and honored, and blessed with good fortune. Look at this sunset, it's beautiful, nay? This sunset exists. Tomorrow does not exist. There is only now. Please look. It is so beautiful and it will never happen ever again. Never, not this sunset. Never in all infinity. Lose yourself in it. Make yourself one with nature and do not worry about karma, yours, mine, or that of the village. He found himself beguiled by her serenity and by her words. He looked westward. Great splashes of purple red and black were spreading across the sky. He watched the sun until it vanished. I wish you were to be consort, he said. I belong to Lord Buntaro and until he is dead I cannot think or say what might be thought or said. Karma, thought Blackthorn. Do I accept karma? Mine? Hers? Theirs? The night's beautiful. And so is she and she belongs to another. Yes, she's beautiful. And very wise, leave the problems of God to God and karma to karma. You did come here uninvited. You are here. You are in their power. But what's the answer? The answer will come, he told himself. Because there's a God in heaven, a God somewhere. He heard the tread of feet. Some flares were approaching up the hill. Twenty samurai only at their head. I'm sorry, Anjid-san, but Omi-san orders you to give him your pistols. Tell him to go to hell. I can't, Anjid-san. I dare not. Blackthorn kept one hand loosely on the pistol hilt, his eyes on Omi. He had deliberately remained seated on the veranda steps. Ten samurai were within the garden behind Omi, the rest near the waiting palanquin. As soon as Omi had entered uninvited, Fujiko had come from the interior of the house and now stood on the veranda, white-faced, behind Blackthorn. Lord Toronaga never objected and for days I've been armed around him and Yabu-san. Mariko said nervously. Yes, Anjin-san, but please understand, what Omi-san says is true. It's our custom that you cannot go into a daimyo's presence with arms. There's nothing to be af nothing to concern you. Yabu-san's your friend. You're his guest here. Tell Omi-san I won't give him my guns. Then, when she remained silent, Blackthorn's temper snapped, and he shook his head. I, Omi-san. Wakarimasuka? I. Omi's face tightened. He snarled in order. Two samurai moved forward. Blackthorn whipped out the guns. The samurai stopped. Both guns were pointed directly into Omi's face. I. Blackthorn said. And then, to Mariko. Tell him to call them off, or I'll pull the triggers. She did so. No one moved. Blackthorn got slowly to his feet, the pistols never wavering from their target. Omi was absolutely still, fearless, his eyes following Blackthorn's cat-like movements. Please, Anjin-san. This is very dangerous. You must see Lord Yabu. You may not go with pistols. You're Hatamoto, you're protected and you're also Lord Yabu's guest. Tell Omi-san if he or any of his men come within ten feet of me I'll blow his head off. Omi-san says politely, for the last time you are ordered to give me the guns. Now. I. Why not leave them here, Anjin-san? There's nothing to fear. 
No one will touch. You think I'm a fool? Then give them to Fujiko-san. What can she do? He'll take them from her. Anyone will take them. Then I'm defenseless. Mariko's voice sharpened. Why don't you listen, Anjin-san? Fujiko-san is your consort. If you order it, she'll protect the guns with her life. That's her duty. I'll never tell you again, but Totono Yusagi Fujiko is samurai. Blackthorn was concentrating on Omi, hardly listening to her. Tell Omi-san I don't like orders. I'm Lord Torunaga's guest. I'm Lord Jabu's guest. You ask guests to do things? You don't order them, and you don't march into a man's house uninvited. Mariko translated this. Omi listened expressionlessly, then replied shortly, watching the unwavering barrels. He says, I, Kasiji Omi, I would ask for your pistols, and ask you to come with me because Kasiji Yabusama orders you into his presence. But Kasiji Yabusama orders me to order you to give me your weapons. So sorry, Anjin-san, for the last time I order you to give them to me. Blackthorn's chest was constricted. He knew he was going to be attacked, and he was furious at his own stupidity. But there comes a time when you can't take any more, and you pull a gun or a knife, and then blood is spilled through stupid pride. Most times stupid. If I'm to die, Omi will die first, by God. He felt very strong, though somewhat lightheaded. Then what Mariko said began to ring in his ears. Fujiko samurai, she is your consort. And his brain began to function. Just a moment. Mariko-san, please say this to Fujiko-san. Exactly. I'm going to give you my pistols. You are to guard them. No one except me is to touch them. Mariko did as he asked, and behind him, he heard Fujiko say, Hi. Wakarimasu ka, Fujiko-san? He asked her. Wakarimasu, Anjin-san. She replied in a thin, nervous voice. Mariko-san, please tell Omi-san I'll go with him now. I'm sorry there's been a misunderstanding. Yes, I'm sorry there was a misunderstanding. Blackthorn backed away, then turned. Fujiko accepted the guns, perspiration beating her forehead. He faced Omi and prayed he was right. Shall we go now? Omi spoke to Fujiko and held out his hand. She shook her head. He gave a short order. The two samurai started toward her. Immediately she shoved one pistol into the sash of her obi, held the other with both hands at arm's length, and leveled it at Omi. The trigger came back slightly and the striking lever moved. Ugoku na, she said. Dozo. The samurai obeyed. They stopped. Omi spoke rapidly and angrily and she listened and when she replied her voice was soft and polite but the pistol never moved from his face, the lever half cocked now, and she ended. I, Gomen Nasai, Omi-san. No, I'm sorry, Omi-san. Blackthorn waited. A samurai moved a fraction. The lever came back dangerously, almost to the top of its arc but her arm remained steady. Ugoku na, she ordered. No one doubted that she would pull the trigger. Not even Blackthorn. Omi said something curtly to her and to his men. They came back. She lowered the pistol, but it was still ready. What did he say? Blackthorn asked. Only that he would report this incident to Yabu-san. Good. Tell him I will do the same. Blackthorn turned to her. Domo, Fujiko-san. Then... Remembering the way Toranaga and Yabu talked to women, he grunted imperiously at Mariko. Come on, Mariko-san. Ikamasho. He started for the gate. Anjin-san. Fujiko called out. Hi. Blackthorn stopped. Fujiko was bowing to him and spoke quickly to Mariko. Mariko's eyes widened, then she nodded and replied, and spoke to Omi who also nodded, clearly enraged but restraining himself. What's going on? Please be patient, Anjin-san. Fujiko called out, and there was an answer from within the house. A maid came onto the veranda. In her hands were two swords. Samurai swords. Fujiko took them reverently, offered them to Blackthorn with a bow, speaking softly. Mariko said, 
Your consort rightly points out that a Hatamoto is, of course, obliged to wear the two swords of the samurai. More than that, it's his duty to do so. She believes it would not be correct for you to go to Lord Yabu without swords that it would be impolite. By our law it's duty to carry swords. She asks if you would consider using these, unworthy though they are, until you buy your own. Blackthorn stared at her, then at Fujiko and back to her again. Does that mean I'm samurai? That Lord Toranaga made me samurai? I don't know, Anjin-san. But there's never been a Hatamoto who wasn't samurai. Never. Mariko turned and questioned Omi. Impatiently he shook his head and answered. Omi-san doesn't know either. Certainly it's the special privilege of a Hatamoto to wear swords at all times, even in the presence of Lord Toranaga. It is his duty because he's a completely trustworthy bodyguard. Also only a Hatamoto has the right of immediate audience with the Lord. Blackthorn took the short sword and stuck it in his belt, then the other, the long one, the killing one, exactly as Omi was wearing his. Armed, he did feel better. Arigato Gozia Mishida, Fujiko-san, he said quietly. She lowered her eyes and replied softly. Mariko translated. Fujiko-san says, with permission, Lord, because you must learn our language correctly and quickly, she humbly wishes to point out that domo is more than sufficient for a man to say. Arigato, with or without Gozia Mishida, is an unnecessary politeness, an expression that only women use. Hi. Domo. Wakarimasu, Fujiko-san. Blackthorn looked at her clearly for the first time with his newfound knowledge. He saw the sweat on her forehead and the sheen on her hands. The narrow eyes and square face and ferret teeth. Please tell my consort, in this one case I do not consider Arigato Gozia Mishida an unnecessary politeness to her. Yabu glanced at the swords again. Blackthorn was sitting cross-legged on a cushion in front of him in the place of honor, Mariko to one side, Igarashi beside him. They were in the main room of the fortress. Omi finished talking. Yabu shrugged. You handled it badly, nephew. Of course it's the consort's duty to protect the Anjin-san and his property. Of course he has the right to wear swords now. Yes, you handled it badly. I made it clear the Anjin-san's my honored guest here. Apologize to him. Immediately Omi got up and knelt in front of Blackthorn and bowed. I apologize for my error, Anjin-san. He heard Mariko say that the barbarian accepted the apology. He bowed again and calmly went back to his place and sat down again. But he was not calm inside. He was now totally consumed by one idea, the killing of Yabu. He had decided to do the unthinkable, kill his liege lord and the head of his clan. But not because he had been made to apologize publicly to the barbarian. In this Yabu had been right. Omi knew he had been unnecessarily inept, for although Yabu had stupidly ordered him to take the pistols away at once tonight, he knew they should have been manipulated away and left in the house, to be stolen later or broken later. And the Anjin-san had been perfectly correct to give the pistols to his consort, he told himself, just as she was equally correct to do what she did. And she would certainly have pulled the trigger, her aim true. It was no secret that Yusagi Fujiko sought death, or why. Omi knew, too, that if it hadn't been for his earlier decision this morning to kill Yabu, he would have stepped forward into death, and then his men would have taken the pistols away from her. He would have died nobly as she would be ordered into death nobly and men and women would have told the tragic tale for generations. Songs and poems and even a no-play also inspiring and tragic and brave, about the three of them, the faithful consort and faithful samurai who both died dutifully because of the incredible barbarian who came from the eastern sea. No, Omi's decision had nothing to do with this public apology, although the unfairness added to the hatred that now obsessed him. The main reason was that today Yabu had publicly insulted Omi's mother and wife in front of peasants by keeping them waiting for hours in the sun like peasants and had then dismissed them without acknowledgement like peasants. It doesn't matter, my son, his mother had said. 
It's his privilege. He's our liege lord. Midori, his wife, had said, the tears of shame running down her cheeks. Please excuse him. And he didn't invite either of you to greet him and his officers at the fortress. Omi had continued. At the meal you arranged. The food and sake alone cost one koku. It's our duty, my son. It's our duty to do whatever Lord Yabu wants. And the order about father? It's not an order yet. It's a rumor. The message from father said he'd heard that Yabu's going to order him to shave his head and become a priest, or slit his belly open. Yabu's wife privately boasts it. That was whispered to your father by a spy. You cannot always trust spies. So sorry, but your father, my son, isn't always wise. What happens to you, mother, if it isn't a rumor? Whatever happens is karma. You must accept karma. No, these insults are unendurable. Please, my son, accept them. I gave Yabu the key to the ship, the key to the Anjin San and the new barbarians, and the way out of Torunaga's trap. My help has brought him immense prestige. With the symbolic gift of the sword, he's now second to Torunaga in the armies of the East. And what have we got in return? Filthy insults. Accept your karma. You must, husband, I beg you, listen to the lady, your mother. I can't live with this shame. I will have vengeance, and then I will kill myself, and these shames will pass from me. For the last time, my son, accept your karma, I beg you. My karma is to destroy Yabu. The old lady had sighed. Very well. You're a man. You have the right to decide. What is to be is to be. But the killing of Yabu by itself is nothing. We must plan. His son must also be removed, and also Igarashi. Particularly Igarashi. Then your father will lead the clan as is his right. How do we do that, mother? We will plan, you and I. And be patient, nay? Then we must consult with your father. Midori, even you may give counsel, but try not to make it valueless, nay? What about Lord Torunaga? He gave Yabu his sword. I think Lord Torunaga only wants eyes as strong and a vassal state. Not as an ally. He doesn't want allies any more than the Taiko did. Yabu thinks he's an ally. I think Torunaga detests allies. Our clan will prosper as Torunaga vassals. Or as Ishido vassals. Who to choose, eh? And how to do the killing? Omi remembered the surge of joy that had possessed him once the decision had been made final. He felt it now. But none of it showed on his face as cha and wine were offered by carefully selected maids imported from Mishima for Yabu. He watched Yabu and the Anjin-san and Mariko and Igarashi. They were all waiting for Yabu to begin. The room was large and airy, big enough for thirty officers to dine and wine and talk. There were many other rooms and kitchens for bodyguards and servants, and a skirting garden, and though all were makeshift and temporary, they had been excellently constructed in the time at his disposal and easily defendable. That the cost had come out of Omi's increased fief bothered him not at all. This had been his duty. He looked through the open shoji. Many sentries in the forecourt. A stable. The fortress was guarded by a ditch. The stockade was constructed of giant bamboos lashed tightly. Big central pillars supported the tiled roof. Walls were light sliding shoji screens, some shuttered, most of them covered with oiled paper as was usual. Good planks for the flooring were set on pilings raised off beaten earth below, and these were covered with tadamas. At Yabu's command, Omi had ransacked four villages for materials to construct this and the other house and Igarashi had brought quality tatamas and futons and things unobtainable in the village. Omi was proud of his work, and the bivouac camp for three thousand samurai had been made ready on the plateau over the hill that guarded the roads that led to the village and to the shore. Now the village was locked tight and safe by land. From the sea there would always be plenty of warning for a liege lord to escape. But I have no liege lord. Whom shall I serve now? Omi was asking himself. Ikawa Jukyu? Or Torunaga directly? 
Would Toronaga give me what I want in return? Or Ishido? Ishido's so difficult to get to, nay? But much to tell him now. This afternoon Yabu had summoned Igarashi, Omi, and the four chief captains and had set into motion his clandestine training plan for the 500-gun samurai. Igarashi was to be commander, Omi was to lead one of the hundreds. They had arranged how to induct Toronaga's men into the units when they arrived, and how these outlanders were to be neutralized if they proved treacherous. Omi had suggested that another highly secret cadre of three more units of one hundred samurai each should be trained surreptitiously on the other side of the peninsula as replacements, as a reserve, and as a precaution against the treacherous move by Toronaga. Who'll command Toronaga's men? Who'll he send as second in command? Igarashi had asked. It makes no difference, Yabu had said. I'll appoint his five assistant officers who'll be given the responsibility of slitting his throat, should it be necessary. The code for killing him and all the outlanders will be plum tree. Tomorrow, Igarashi-san, you will choose the men. I will approve each personally and none of them is to know, yet, my overall strategy of the musket regiment. Now as Omi was watching Yabu, he savored the newfound ecstasy of vengeance. To kill Yabu would be easy, but the killing must be coordinated. Only then would his father or his elder brother be able to assume control of the clan, and Aizu. Yabu came to the point. Mariko-san, please tell the Anjin-san, tomorrow I want him to start training my men to shoot like barbarians and I want to learn everything there is to know about the way that barbarians war. But so sorry, the guns won't arrive for six days, Yabu-san, Mariko reminded him. I've enough among my men to begin with. Yabu replied. I want him to start tomorrow. Mariko spoke to Blackthorn. What does he want to know about war? He asked. He said everything. What particularly? Mariko asked Yabu. Yabu-san says, have you been part of any battles on land? Yes. In the Netherlands. One in France. Yabu-san says, excellent. He wants to know European strategy. He wants to know how battles are fought in your lands. In detail. Blackthorn thought a moment. Then he said, Tell Yabusan I can train any number of men for him, and I know exactly what he wants to know. He had learned a great deal about the way the Japanese warred from Friar Domingo. The friar had been an expert and vitally concerned. After all, senor, the old man had said, that knowledge is essential. Isn't it to know how the heathen war? Every father must protect his flock. And are not our glorious conquistadores the blessed spearhead of Mother Church? And haven't I been with them in the front of the fighting in the New World in the Philippines and studied them for more than twenty years? I know war, senor, I know war. It has been my duty God's will to know war. Perhaps God has sent you to me to teach you, in case I die. Listen, my flock here in this jail have been my teachers about Japan warfare, senor. So now I know how their armies fight and how to beat them. How they could beat us. Remember, senor, I tell thee a secret on thy soul. Never join Japanese ferocity with modern weapons and modern methods. Or on land they will destroy us. Blackthorn committed himself to God. And began. Tell Lord Jabu I can help him very much and Lord Toronaga. I can make their armies unbeatable. Lord Yabu says, if your information proves useful, Anjitsan, he will increase your salary from Lord Toronaga's 240 koku to 500 koku after one month. Thank him. But say, if I do all that for him, I request a favor in return. I want him to rescind his decree about the village and I want my ship and crew back in five months. Mariko said, Anjin-san, you cannot bargain with him, like a traitor. Please ask him, as a humble favor, from an honored guest and grateful vassal to be. Yabu frowned and replied at length. Yabu-san says that the village is unimportant. The villagers need a fire under their rumps to make them do anything. You are not to concern yourself with them. As to the ship, it's in Lord Toronaga's care. He's sure you'll get it back soon. 
He asked me to put your request to Lord Toranaga the moment I arrive in Yido. I'll do this, Anjin-san. Please apologize to Lord Yabu, but I must ask him to rescind the decree. Tonight. He's just said no, Anjin-san. It would not be good manners. Yes, I understand. But please ask him again. It's very important to me. A petition. He says you must be patient. Don't concern yourself with villagers. Blackthorn nodded. Then he decided. Thank you? I understand. Yes. Please thank you, Beersen, but tell him I cannot live with this shame. Mariko blanched. What? I cannot live with the shame of having the village on my conscience. I'm dishonored. I cannot endure this. It's against my Christian belief. I will have to commit suicide at once. Suicide? Yes. That's what I've decided to do. Yabu interrupted. Nanja Mariko-san? Haltingly she translated what Blackthorn had said. Yabu questioned her, and she answered. Then Yabu said, If it wasn't for your reaction this would be a joke, Mariko-san. Why are you so concerned? Why do you think he means it? I don't know, sire. He seems... I don't know. Her voice trailed off. Omi-san? Suicides against all Christian beliefs, sire. They never suicide as we do. As a samurai would. Mariko-san, you're Christian. Is that true? Yes, sire. Suicide's a mortal sin against the word of God. Igarashi-san? What do you think? It's a bluff. He's no Christian. Remember the first day, sire? Remember what he did to the priest. And what he allowed Omisan to do to him to save the boy. Yabu smiled, recollecting that day and the night that had followed. Yes. I agree. He's no Christian, Mariko-san. So sorry, but I don't understand, sire. What about the priest? Yabu told her what had happened the first day between Blackthorn and the priest. He desecrated a cross, she said, openly shocked, and threw the pieces into the dust, Igarashi added. It's all a bluff, sire. If this thing with the village dishonors him, how can he stay here when Omi-san so dishonored him by pissing on him? What? I'm sorry, sire, Mariko said, but again I don't understand. Yabu said to Omi, explain that to her. Omi obeyed. She was disgusted by what he told her but kept it off her face. Afterwards the Anjin-san was completely cowed, Mariko-san. Omi finished. Without weapons he'll always be cowed. Yabu sipped some sake. Say this to him, Mariko-san, suicide's not a barbarian custom. It's against his Christian god. So how can he suicide? Mariko translated. Yabu was watching carefully as Blackthorn replied. The Anjin-san apologizes with great humility, but he says, custom or not, God or not, this shame of the village is too great to bear. He says that. That he's in Japan, he's had a motto and has the right to live according to our laws. Her hands were trembling. That's what he said, Yabu-san. The right to live according to our customs are law. Barbarians have no rights. She said, Lord Torunaga made him Hatamoto. That gives him the right, nay? A breeze touched the shojis, rattling them. How could he commit suicide? Eh? Ask him. Blackthorn took out the short, needle-sharp sword and placed it gently on the tatame, point facing him. Igarashi said simply, It's a bluff. Who ever heard of a barbarian acting like a civilized person? Yabu frowned, his heartbeat slowed by the excitement. He's a brave man, Igarashi-san. No doubt about that. And strange. But this? Yabu wanted to see the act, to witness the barbarian's measure, to see how he went into death, to experience with him the ecstasy of the going. With an effort he stopped the rising tide of his own pleasure. What's your counsel, Omi-san? He asked throatily. You said to the village, sire, if the Anjin-san did not learn satisfactorily. I counsel you to make a slight concession. 
say to him that whatever he learns within the five months will be satisfactory, but he must, in return, swear by his God never to reveal this to the village. But he's not Christian. How will that oath bind him? I believe he's a type of Christian, sire. He's against the black robes and that's what is important. I believe swearing by his own God will be binding. And he should also swear, in this God's name, that he'll apply his mind totally to learning and totally to your service. Because he's clever he will have learned very much in five months. Thus your honor is saved, his if it exists or not is also saved. You lose nothing, gain everything. Very important, you gain his allegiance of his own free will. You believe he'll kill himself? Yes. Mariko-san? I don't know, Yabu-san. I'm sorry, I cannot advise you. A few hours ago I would have said, No, he will not commit suicide. Now I don't know. He's. Since Omi-san came for him tonight, he's been. Different. Igarashi-san? If you give in to him now, and it's bluff he'll use the same trick all the time. He's cunning as a fox cami we've all seen how cunning, nay? You'll have to say no one day, sire. I counsel you to say it now it's a bluff. Omi leaned forward and shook his head. Sire, please excuse me, but I must repeat, if you say no you risk a great loss. If it is a bluff and it may well be then as a proud man he will become hateful at his further humiliation and he won't help you to the limit of his being, which you need. He's asked for something as a Hatamoto which he's entitled to. He says he wants to live according to our customs of his own free will. Isn't that an enormous step forward, sire? That's marvelous for you, and for him. I counsel caution. Use him to your advantage. I intend to. Yabu said thickly. Igarashi said. Yes, he's valuable and yes, I want his knowledge. But he's got to be controlled, UV said that many times, Omi-san. He's barbarian. That's all he is. Oh, I know. He's had a moto today and yes, he can wear the two swords from today. But that doesn't make him samurai. He's not samurai and never will be. Mariko knew that of all of them she should be able to read the Anjinsen the most clearly. But she could not. One moment she understood him, the next, he was incomprehensible again. One moment she liked him, the next she hated him. Why? Blackthorn's haunted eyes looked into the distance. But now there were beads of sweat on his forehead. Is that from fear? Thought Yabu. Fear that the bluff will be called? Is he bluffing? Mariko-san? Yes, Lord. Tell him. Yabu's mouth was suddenly dry, his chest aching. Tell the Anjin-san the sentence stays. Sire, please excuse me, but I urge you to accept Omi-san's advice. Yabu did not look at her, only at Blackthorn. The vein in his forehead pulsed. The Anjinsen says he's decided. So be it. Let's see if he's barbarian or Hatamoto. Mariko's voice was almost imperceptible. Anjinsan, Yabu-san says the sentence stays. I'm sorry. Blackthorn heard the words but they did not disturb him. He felt stronger and more at peace than he had ever been with a greater awareness of life than he had ever had. While he was waiting he had not been listening to them or watching them. The commitment had been made. The rest he had left to God. He had been locked in his own head, hearing the same words over and over, the same that had given him the clue to life here, the words that surely had been sent from God, through Mariko as medium. There is an easy solution die. To survive here you must live according to our customs. The sentence stays. So now I must die. I should be afraid. But I'm not. Why? I don't know. I know only that once I truly decided that the sole way to live here as a man is to do so according to their customs, to risk death, to die perhaps to die that suddenly the fear of death was gone. Life and death are the same. Leave karma to karma. I am not afraid to die. Beyond the shoji. A gentle rain had begun to fall. He looked down at the knife. I've had a good life, he thought. 
his eyes came back to Yabu. Wakarimasu, he said clearly, and though he knew his lips had formed the word, it was as though someone else had spoken. No one moved. He watched his right hand pick up the knife. Then his left also grasped the hilt, the blade steady and pointing at his heart. Now there was only the sound of his life, building and building, soaring louder and louder until he could listen no more. His soul cried out for eternal silence. The cry triggered his reflexes. His hands drove the knife unerringly toward its target. Omi had been ready to stop him, but he was unprepared for the suddenness and ferocity of Blackthorn's thrust, and as Omi's left hand caught the blade and his right the haft, pain bit into him and blood spilled from his left hand. He fought the power of the thrust with all his strength. He was losing. Then Igarashi helped. Together they halted the blow. The knife was taken away. A thin trickle of blood ran from the skin over Blackthorn's heart where the point of the knife had entered. Mariko and Yabu had not moved. Yabu said, Say to him, say to him whatever he learns is enough, Mariko-san. Order him no, ask him, ask the Anjin-san to swear as Omi-san said. Everything as Omi-san said. Blackthorn came back from death slowly. He stared at them and the knife from an immense distance without understanding. Then the torrent of his life rushed back but he could not grasp its significance, believing himself dead and not alive. Anjin-san? Anjin-san? He saw her lips move and heard her words but all his senses were concentrated on the rain and the breeze. Yes? His own voice was still far off but he smelled the rain and heard the droplets and tasted the sea salt upon the air. I'm alive, he told himself in wonder. I'm alive and that's real rain outside and the wind's real and from the north. There's a real brazier with real coals and if I pick up the cup it will have real liquid in it and it will have taste. I'm not dead. I'm alive. The other sat in silence, waiting patiently, gentle with him to honor his bravery. No man in Japan had ever seen what they had seen. Each was asking silently, What's the Anjin-san going to do now? Will he be able to stand by himself and walk away or will his spirit leave him? How would I act if I were he? Silently a servant brought a bandage and bound Omi's hand where the blade had cut deeply, staunching the flow of blood. Everything was very still. From time to time Mariko would say his name quietly as they sipped chow or sake, but very sparingly, savoring the waiting, the watching, and the remembering. For Blackthorn this no life seemed to last forever. Then his eyes saw. His ears heard. Anjin-san? Hi. He answered through the greatest weariness he had ever known. Mariko repeated what Omi had said as though it came from Yabu. She had to say it several times before she was sure that he understood clearly. Blackthorn collected the last of his strength, victory sweet to him. My word is enough as his is enough. Even so, I'll swear by God as he wants. Yes. As Yabu-san will swear by his God in equal honor to keep his side of the bargain. Lord Yabu says yes, he swears by the Lord Buddha. So Blackthorn swore as Yabu wished him to swear. He accepted some cha. Never had it tasted so good. The cup seemed very heavy, and he could not hold it for long. The rain is fine, isn't it? He said, watching the raindrops breaking and vanishing, astonished by the untoward clarity of his vision. Yes, she told him gently, knowing that his senses were on a plane never to be reached by one who had not gone freely out to meet death, and through an unknowing karma, miraculously come back again. Why not rest now, Anjin-san? Lord Yabu thanks you and says he will talk more with you tomorrow. You should rest now. Yes. Thank you. That would be fine. Do you think you can stand? Yes. I think so. Yabu-san asks if you would like a palanquin? Blackthorn thought about that. At length he decided that a samurai would walk would try to walk. No, thank you, he said, as much as he would have liked to lie down, to be carried back, to close his eyes and to sleep instantly. 
At the same time he knew he would be afraid to sleep yet, in case this was the dream of after death, and the knife not there on the futon, but still buried in the real him, and this hell, or the beginning of hell. Slowly he took up the knife and studied it, glorying in the real feel. Then he put it in its scabbard, everything taking so much time. Sorry I'm so slow, he murmured. You mustn't be sorry, Anjin san Tonight you're reborn. This is another life, a new life, Mariko said proudly, filled with honor for him. It's given to few to return. Do not be sorry. We know it takes great fortitude. Most men do not have enough strength left afterwards even to stand. May I help you? No. No, thank you. It is no dishonor to be helped. I would be honored to be allowed to help you. Thank you. But I wish to try. First. But he could not stand at once. He had to use his hands to get to his knees and then he had to pause to get more strength. Later he lurched up and almost fell. He swayed but did not fall. Yabu bowed. And Noriko, Omi, and Igarashi. Blackthorn walked like a drunk for the first few paces. He clutched a pillar and held on for a moment. Then he began again. He faltered, but he was walking away, alone. As a man. He kept one hand on the long sword in his belt, and his head was high. Yabu exhaled and drank deeply of the sake. When he could speak he said to Mariko, Please follow him. See that he gets home safely. Yes, sire. When she had gone, Jabu turned on Igarashi. You mender pile fool! Instantly Igarashi bowed his head to the mat in penitence. Bluff you said nay? Your stupidity almost cost me a priceless treasure. Yes, sire, you're right, sire. I beg leave to end my life at once. That would be too good for you. Go and live in the stables until I send for you. Sleep with the stupid horses. You're a horse-headed fool. Yes, sire. I apologize, sire. Get out. Omi-san will command the guns now. Get out. The candles flickered and spluttered. One of the maids spilled the tiniest drop of sake on the small lacquered table in front of Yabu, and he cursed her eloquently. The others apologized at once. He allowed them to placate him, and accepted more wine. Bluff? Bluff, he said. Fool! Why do I have fools around me? Omi said nothing, screaming with laughter inside. But you're no fool, Omi-san. Your counsel's valuable. Your fiefs doubled from today. Six thousand koku. For next year. Take thirty re-around and gyro as your fief. Omi bowed to the futon. Yabu deserves to die, he thought scornfully, he's so easy to manipulate. I deserve nothing, sire. I was just doing my duty. Yes. But a liege lord should reward faithfulness and duty. Yabu was wearing the Yashitomo sword tonight. It gave him great pleasure to touch it. Suzu. He called to one of the maids. Send Zukimoto here. How soon will war begin? Omi asked. This year. Maybe you have six months, perhaps not. Why? Perhaps the Lady Mariko should stay more than three days. To protect you. Eh? Why? She's the mouth of the Anjinsan. In half a month with her he can train twenty men who can train a hundred who can train the rest. Then whether he lives or dies doesn't matter. Why should he die? You're going to call the Anjin San again, his next challenge or the one after, sire. The result may be different next time, who knows? You may want him to die. Both men knew, as Mariko and Igarashi had known, that for Yabu to swear by any god was meaningless and, of course, he had no intention of keeping any promise. You may want to put pressure on him. Once you have the information, what good is the carcass? None. You need to learn barbarian war strategy, but you must do it very quickly. Lord Toranaga may send for him, so you must have the woman as long as you can. Half a month should be enough to squeeze his head dry of what he knows, now that you have his complete attention. 
you'll have to experiment, to adapt their methods to our ways. Yes, it would take at least half a month. Nay, and Torinaga-san? He will agree, if it's put correctly to him, sire. He must. The guns are his as well as yours. And her continuing presence here is valuable in other ways. Yes, Yabu said with satisfaction, for the thought of holding her as hostage had also entered his mind on the ship when he had planned to offer Torinaga as a sacrifice to Ishido. Totem Mariko should be protected, certainly. It would be bad if she fell into evil hands. Yes. And perhaps she could be the means of controlling Hiromatsu, Buntaro, and all their clan, even Torinaga. You draft the message about her. Omi said offhand. My mother heard from Yido today, sire. She asked me to tell you that the Lady Jinjiko has presented Torinaga with his first grandson. Yabu was at once attentive. Torinaga's grandson. Could Torinaga be controlled through this infant? The grandson assures Torinaga's dynasty, nay? How can I get the infant as hostage? And Okiba, the lady Okiba? He asked. She's left Yido with all her entourage. Three days ago. By now she's safe in Lord Ishido's territory. Yabu thought about Okiba and her sister, Genjiko. So different. Okiba, vital, beautiful, cunning, relentless, the most desirable woman in the empire and mother of the air. Genjiko, her younger sister, quiet, brooding, flat-faced and plain, with a pitilessness that was legend, even now, that had come down to her from their mother, who was one of Garoda's sisters. The two sisters loved each other, but Okiba hated Torunaga and his brood as Genjiko detested the Taiko and Yemen, his son. Did the Taiko really father Okiba's son? Jabu asked himself again, as all daimyos had done secretly for years. What wouldn't I give to know the answer to that? What wouldn't I give to possess that woman? Now that Lady Okiba's no longer hostage in Yido. That could be good and bad, Yabu said tentatively. Nay, good, only good. Now Ishido and Torinaga must begin very soon. Omi deliberately omitted the Sama from those two names. The Lady Mariko should stay for your protection. See to it. Draft the message to send to Torinaga. Suzu, the maid, knocked discreetly and opened the door. Tsukamoto came into the room. Sire? Where are all the gifts I ordered brought from Ishima for Omi-san? They're all in the storehouse, Lord. Here's the list. The two horses can be selected from the stables. Do you want me to do that now? No. Omi-san will choose them tomorrow. Yabu glanced at the carefully written list. Twenty kimonos, two swords, one suit of armor, two horses, arms for one hundred samurai, one sword, helmet, breastplate, bow, twenty arrows and spear for each man. Total Value 426 koku. Also the rock called the waiting stone value, priceless. Ah, uh, yes, he said in better humor, remembering that night. The rock I found in Kyushu. You were going to rename it the waiting barbarian, weren't you? Yes, sire, if it still pleases you, Omi said. But would you honor me tomorrow by deciding where it should go in the garden? I don't think there's a place good enough. Tomorrow I'll decide. Yes. Yabu let his mind rest on the rock, and on those far-off days with his revered master, the Taiko, and last on the night of the screams. Melancholy seeped into him. Life is so short and sad and cruel, he thought. He eyed Suzu. The maid smiled back hesitantly, oval-faced, slender, and very delicate like the other two. The three had been brought by Palanquin from his household in Mishima. Tonight they were all barefoot, their kimonos the very best silk, their skins very white. Curious that boys can be so graceful, he pondered, in many ways more feminine, more sensuous than girls are. Then he noticed Tsukamoto. What are you waiting for? Eh? Get out. Yes, sire. You asked me to remind you about taxes, sire. Zukimoto heaved up his sweating bulk and gratefully hurried away. 
Omi san, you will double all taxes at once, Yabu said. Yes, sire. Filthy peasants. They don't work hard enough. They're lazy, all of them. I keep the roads safe from bandits, the seas safe, give them good government. And what do they do? They spend the days drinking cha and sake and eating rice. It's time my peasants lived up to their responsibility. Yes, sire, Omi said. Next, Yabu turned to the subject that possessed his mind. The Anjinsan astonished me tonight. But not you. Oh, yes, he did, sire. More than you. But you were wise to make him commit himself. You say Igarashi was right? I merely admired your wisdom, sire. You would have had to say no to him sometime. I think you were very wise to say it now, tonight. I thought he'd killed himself. Yes. I'm glad you were ready. I planned on you being ready. The Anjin San's an extraordinary man, for a barbarian, nay? A pity he's barbarian and so naive. Yes. Yabu yawned. He accepted sake from Suzu. Half a month, you say? Mariko-san should stay at least that, Omi-san. Then I'll decide about her, and about him. He'll need to be taught another lesson soon. He laughed, showing his bad teeth. If the Anjin-san teaches us, we should teach him, nay? He should be taught how to commit seppuku correctly. That'd be something to watch, nay? See to it. Yes, I agree the barbarian's days are numbered.